Hi everybody, Pam Police here from the Dick Biondi documentary. And I'm here with my good buddy, Joe Farina, Director of Communications and Marketing for the Dick Biondi film. And we have a very special guest tonight. We have the author of the book, The Chicago Music Scene, 1960s and 70s, Dean Milano. And Dean is also a working musician. He's been a very busy guy. And uh, thanks for joining us. Hey, what the heck? Most of us don't have much else to do, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I hear you had a gig today. Tell us yeah, about it. Where were you? I was at a uh, senior home out in Batavia. And this is the second time I've done this now in the last few weeks. They have us play out on a parking lot or a patio. And all the guests either watch from their balconies or they come down and sit in, in seats around outside. We don't go inside. We don't get near anybody, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I played, today I played for about an hour. And they set me up on a, in the back of a pickup truck. And after an hour, they moved me across their campus, as they call it, to a new location. And I played for another hour. How cool is that? That's great. They wonderful. And the, the residents were wonderful. They were applauding and yelling out requests and everything else. Oh. And uh, it was really fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I love playing for the, I love playing for the seniors. I mean, I do a lot of senior homes. And uh, I always enjoy it because I get to play songs that I don't get to play in the bars and the restaurants and the clubs. Because I can play stuff from the 20s and 30s and 40s, 50s and 60s. Or in the bars, you can't do 20s and 30s and 40s. Nobody wants oh. to hear wonderful music and nobody wants to hear it. So the seniors love it. That's, that's their music. True. And it's my that's music. I, I'm a senior. I'm 69 years old. So that's my and music. We all are, well, no, not we, we are. Joe's not. Joe's a youngster oh. over here. Oh, yeah, right. Dean, I Yeah. <laughs> Dean, I wanted to ask you if you could tell us uh, a little bit about your musical influences and when you got into music and when you started to play uh, the guitar. When did that all start for you? I started playing, well, I started playing music back in like 1959 when my parents uh, got me accordion lessons because in, I lived in Milwaukee. And in Milwaukee, there was a law that you had to play the accordion or you'd be arrested. <laughs> <laughs> when looking yeah, on a Saturday well. morning, you'd walk down the street on a Saturday morning and you could hear all the accordions coming out of all the houses, all the kids practicing their accordions. <laughs> so we, we had a, a traveling salesman came to our door with accordions and my parents bought one for me and my brother Paul, each of us. Wow. So I started out on the accordion and, and I really loved it. I enjoyed it. And I, and I found that I would, uh, when I was not having to, you know, practicing my lessons, I would listen to the radio and I would learn the pop songs on the radio on my accordion, and I could actually figure them out. I could figure the chords out by ear, you know, mm -hmm. which I thought was that what everyone did, and found out years later, no, that was actually fairly unusual that I could do that, you know. Yeah. So you know, here I'm supposed to be playing, you know, Finicula, Finicula, and these Italian songs, and I'm playing, you know, little rock and roll songs and stuff, you know, my accordion. And then around 1966, uh, I switched over to the bass guitar. And I started playing bass, and I got into a little band in 1966 in my neighborhood. Uh, and of course, back then, when you walked down the street on a Saturday morning, there was a band on every block playing in every garage. Oh. We were all garage bands. Oh, and you, yeah, it was, it was wonderful. And as soon as you started playing, all the kids in the neighborhood would come on their bikes, and you'd be surrounded by kids on their bikes cheering. And it was like a big concert, you know, because you weren't good enough to play in clubs or anything yet. You know, so those were your concerts. And then we would get our parents, like, Christmas lights and stuff, and we'd set them up in front of us, and, you know, until they could look like it was a concert, you know. <laughs> and it was, it was so much fun. We loved, and oh. the funny thing is, about, um, oh, years ago, my brothers and I were at my parents' house in Glen Ellen, and we thought, wouldn't it be cool? Let's set up in the garage again like we did when we were kids and play. So we set up all our equipment in my parents' garage on a Saturday morning, started playing, not one person stopped by to listen. Not one. And I said, boy, times have really changed. <laughs> the the yeah, excitement and the though. novelty. Oh my I'm God. sorry, what? The novelty of, of, well, the novelty of, of a live music band in the early 60s, mid 60s was really heavy duty. And yeah. that had worn off here eventually. And it wasn't so exciting to go and hear a little live band in a garage anymore as it was back in the early 60s. And yeah. that's what happened, you know, what are you gonna do? 
Yeah. Things change, you know. You know what? I was walking around my neighborhood a couple weeks ago, and it was like one of the first nice days. And I started hearing, I was on the phone with my brother, actually, and I started hearing this music. And I was like, oh, my God. And this is like when we first started the shutdown. And I was like, you know, and I started hearing this music, and I'm drawn to it. And I'm finally, I walk into the this place, and these guys were actually performing in a garage. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Really social distancing, I hate to tell you, but <laughs> I was like, yes! Yeah. It's so cool to see a band playing together, you know? Right. That's right. We've done it twice in our neighborhood here uh, in the past two months. Uh, I have some musical neighbors who are wonderful, and we set up twice on the driveways in our neighborhood in Elmhurst and had two concerts and we had about 40 people at each concert. All the neighbors come out with their chairs, lawn chairs, setting them up on their lawns. Everyone stays far enough from everybody else. And then one lady makes cookies and popcorn and passes them around to everybody. And we had a great time. It was really fun. People were just like, oh, this is so great to get out of our houses and to hear a live band. And, you know, so I hope we do it again, too. We've done it twice so far. That's beautiful. Uh, it's been fun. It really is fun, yeah. It's really beautiful. Well, let's yeah. talk about your book. Yeah. I mean, this is really something. How long did it take you to make this book, write this book? It took me about a year. Uh, full time, it took a year to write that book. Uh, and what a lot more than you? I thought it was going to take. It's a, it's a lot of research, a lot of research. And you have to make sure you don't make any mistakes. You cannot mis make mistakes in a book like that. Um, and I had to uh, reference a lot of people who are in the different genres, because I have folk, rock, blues, country, jazz. So I had people who were experts in each of those fields and I would send them what I had written and I would say, okay, is this accurate? Have I got everything right here? Mm -hmm. They'd look it over, they'd say, yep, you're, this is fine. You can print that. And I'm like, okay, great. I wanna make sure I got this right. And that's how I did it. Um, and it was, it was tough, it was a lot of research. And once the word got out of the street that I was doing this book, uh, a lot of players actually came to my house with pictures of their old bands. I had uh, Bruce Maddy from, uh, from New Colony Six came over here. Um, Joe Kelly from Shadows of Night came over here. Um, quite a few of the guys actually came here to drop off pictures and then talk to me and give me you know, information I could use in the book. So uh, that really helped a lot. And I've never really had a complaint uh, on the book so far. And it sold a lot of copies and it really it sells very well. Um, it. And if you look on the Amazon reviews, the reviews are kind of funny because a couple of people got on there and obviously they hadn't even read the book yet. All they read was the title, which is Chicago music scene of the 60s and 70s. And the one guy said, how dare you write a book about the Chicago music scene and not talk about all the suburban clubs and all the suburban bands. And I responded and said, you know what? Did you even read the book? There's all kinds of stuff on the suburban clubs and the suburban bands in there. So obviously, you write your review, you complain, you hadn't even read the book. Other than that, the reviews have been really, That's really good. Yeah. That's great. It's a great book. I, I have a copy. And That's uh, again, uh, I noticed my book is not autographed. What is going on here? Oh, oh my God. How could that have happened? I, I thought I autographed every copy in the state. <laughs> Dean, what, uh, in, in your book, you talk about uh, the Chicago music scene of the 1960s and 1970s. What makes um, the Chicago music scene during that time so unique, so historical, and so special? Well, it was a time, particularly in the mid-late 60s, when uh, Chicago bands were taken pretty seriously. They really were. Um, and it's mainly in the rock and roll you know, uh, arena. Uh, the Buckinghams in Billboard magazine were called um, the most listened to band in America. The Buckinghams, a, a band from the Chicago suburbs. You listen to uh, stuff like that. We had um, New Colony Six had some, some top hits in the top 40 uh, across the nation, you know, not just Chicago. There you go. So we had bands like that The Shadows of Night, New Colony Six. Um, uh, we had uh, Eyes of March. Crying Shames, The Mods, The Flock. These yeah. bands had hit records that were on the top 40. Um, mm -hmm. It lasted until the late 60s. Right. And, then it, it, and then it changed. There's a Crying Shames, yeah. And I, my band opened for all these guys back then. 
Um, I had a band called Grope, which still plays. My band Grope still plays to this day. Amazing. Oh, fantastic band. We still play. And we opened for all those bands in those days. And I'll tell you, it was a, it was a kid's dream come true. It really was. We yeah. had so much fun. So the scene was very vibrant at that time. Um, I think what happened, and there are people who don't agree with me, and they don't like what I have to say about this, but I think it's true. Uh, Chicago music was pop oriented. I don't want to call it bubblegum because it wasn't bubblegum, but it was pop oriented. Okay, it was really nice tunes, well written pop music. Now what's happening? I'm sorry. It was kind of uplifting music, wasn't it? It was uplifting. A lot of it was sweet. It was beautiful stuff. Sweet, a lot of harmonies. Yes. The horn bands. The horn bands came along. Mm -hmm. um, what happened, in my opinion, was all of a sudden on the east and west coasts, you had some big changes taking place. You had bands like the Doors, the Jefferson Airplane, the Grateful Dead, um, you know, bands that were really cutting edge. Jimi Hendrix comes along. The Chicago bands didn't quite keep up with what was happening in the rest of the, the world music scene. And they got left behind. And the, and the music changed quite a bit in the late 60s. And Chicago's bands kind of faded away. Um, and I think that's what happened. And again, people aren't going to grip. All you have to do is look at the top 40 charts and you'll see that the Chicago groups disappeared. Now, the band Chicago, CTA, they continued with hit records, mm -hmm. but of course they moved out to Los Angeles right away. Yeah. They weren't in Chicago anymore. They were gone, you know. So the bands that stayed here and tried to keep going, you know, there's Chicago right there on the bottom. That's a long story right there. That, <laughs> getting, that, getting, that, getting that picture. What's that? Getting that picture was a was a was a was a job in itself because I contacted the management team of the band Chicago out in LA. And I said, okay, guys, I'm writing a book on the Chicago music in the 60s and 70s, and I want to include Chicago in my book. All I have you know, so far is nothing. Could you please send me some nice photographs of the band from the early days in Chicago and a bio of the band? And on the phone, a woman says, you know, we're too busy for this kind of thing. I'm sorry, we don't have time for this kind of stuff. And I said, well, Okay, in that case, I've got an old blurry Polaroid photograph of the band, and that's all I've got. That's going to go in this book, and that's going to be a representation of the is? band in my book. Well, within about a week, a huge package arrives on my doorstep. Oh, okay. Big, big folder filled with wonderful photos and bio <laughs> and the whole, the whole history of the band. Uh, so I don't know what changed their mind, but luckily yeah, I so. Wow. Yeah. Gonna it was interesting because yeah. in, in the beginning when the book was just getting off the ground i had a hard time getting responses from people because they were like who's this guy doing this book and who cares you know but as the word got on the street and people started discovering what i was doing i got much more uh, reception from people uh, particularly in the jazz field now in jazz my uncle conti milano was a very famous jazz bass player in chicago he played with charlie parker Miles oh, wow. Davis, Max Roach. He played with all these guys, very famous jazz player. Well, when I would call up these jazz players, these old guys, and I'd say, I'm writing this book on the Chicago jazz scene. They'd say, oh yeah, who, who's this guy? Uh, I'd say, my name is Dean Milano, Conti Milano's nephew. They go, oh my God, you're, you're Conti Milano's nephew? <laughs> yeah, oh my God. And then all of a sudden, bam, they just opened up. And it was like, wow. you're part of the family, buddy. You know, So that, that really helped me. Very cool. That's awesome. And Dean, uh, is it fair to say, um, kind of going back to uh, the Buckinghams and then the band Chicago, is it fair to say that um, Chicago kind of continued, you know, kind of, because I think the Buckinghams set that tone and that unique sound with, uh, with the horn sections right. and so forth. Would you, and is Jim it fair Peter, to say that yeah. Chicago took that inspiration or what have you? and to a whole new level would that sound sure. pretty accurate yeah. i would say it, they did yeah yeah and uh, and jim peter with the eyes of march with the horn yeah. that he used and there was a band called the mob in chicago mm -hmm. that had a whole horn section to it uh, and that became the chicago sound that that horn yeah. sound was the chicago sound and uh yeah and i would say that 
where the other bands kind of faded away. Of course, Peter went on to you know form Survivor after that, mm -hmm. but those original bands faded away. And Chicago continued that that horn sound out in L.A. And to tell you the truth, I haven't followed Chicago, so I don't know sure what they're doing now. I know they got kind of a little more sweet than they were originally because they were they were cutting edge in the beginning. Oh, so yes. They were. Uh, and they got, I think they got sweet after a while. And it's it's good music. It's still very good music, but it's not quite cutting edge the way it was originally. But uh, yeah, I think the bands like the Buckinghams and, and those bands, they did a lot of a lot of influence there. There really was. And they're still performing. And yeah. oh, they're they are. all in the Dick Biondi film. Right, yes. they are. And I think there was there was a there was an era there where those bands kind of disappeared and people lost interest in those bands. And if you look at say the late 70s, maybe early 80s, 80s, I don't think people were interested. And then all of a sudden, you had this nostalgia craze that came along, and all of a sudden, everybody wanted to hear the Buckinghams again, and yeah. the Shadows of Night, and the Crying Shames, and all those bands, and they got on the festival circuit, and now they're all working again, which is wonderful. And now it's they're great. doing the big Cornerstone show at the right. um, Arcata yeah. Theater with Ron uh, and right. I mean, he got them out there twice a year, and they exactly. show up every single show. It's unbelievable. Well, people finally got to the point they where they said, whatever happened to the Buckinghams and the all that great music, where the, what happened to that? We want to hear it again. And here they are, folks, they're back again. So, you know. Isn't that something? Wonderful. And, and Dean, how did um, Dick Biondi play uh, a crucial role in the rock music scene, the Chicago rock music scene, uh, starting in the 1960s when he came to Chicago and started um, at WLS. Can you talk about that a little bit? A little bit. Um, so, of course, I was in Milwaukee, and I didn't get here until 64. So I missed the early 60s in Chicago here. But I know what was happening was, uh, and I think people will corroborate this, was that the DJs had so much more freedom in those days to play songs they would like to play on their show, which you cannot do today. No. Absolutely possible. Uh, so Biondi and, and Clark Weber and people like that would play songs by local bands and say, you know, we want to promote your band. We're going to play your record on my show here. And it got those bands off the ground. It was a wonderful way to do it. Uh, and of course, it can't be done anymore. So that's the important thing that-, uh, and that you know Dick, what the cool thing uh, was about WLS? It was 50,000 watts and it went all across yeah, the country. Yeah, it went all the way to country. California. So the Buckinghams in our right. movie, they talk about how, you know, Dick put them, he put their, their, their song on the radio at night when yeah, that thing yeah. was wide open, they had a national hit. It was, oh, exactly. you know, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it never happened again after that. And I, who knows if I will. The corporations took over pop radio and they did it the way they wanted to. And nobody had any say anymore. So, but it's true. Dick, yeah, Dick Biondi had such a, a big influence uh, on bands, you know, local bands. You know, if he played your record, odds are it's gonna, it was going to be a hit. He had a unique yeah. ear. Uh, that he, you know, it was really, really something special. And, and if he heard something that he liked, mm. he was going to promote it. He was going to play it. And, you know, he was the first, for example, when he played the first Beatles record in 1963, right. you know, that was a unique sound for that time. And Dick said, yeah. wow, you know, there's something different yeah. here. There's something here that I really like. And I'm going to play it. I'm, I'm going to play it on the, sh on the show, on my show on W on WLS in 63. So Dick yeah. really had that influence, that impact on all of those bands. It's pretty well, amazing. Yeah, and they couldn't Valley said in do that the, today. We interviewed Tim no. Valley for the film, and he always, he said, Dick had a good ear. I mean, he yeah. knew something. He, he really knew what he was listening to, you know. He, he could pick a hit. Yeah, those DJs, they knew what the kids wanted to hear, you know? I mean, they, they did the sock hops and all those uh, things. And we saw the, you know, we saw those DJs and all the, the sock hops we went to as kids and they had their, their finger on the pulse of what the kids wanted to hear. So they'd hear, they, Dick would hear something like, you know, uh, the Beatles and said, this is the kind of thing that kids are gonna wanna hear. I'm gonna, now today he could never do that in a million years, you know? Yeah. No station would allow him to play a record like that the way he did. So yeah. it was, why couldn't we get back to that kind of a time? I, I don't know. It's, yeah. Yeah. Very special time. Well, you know what? Our, our time is running out. This has really been fun. But we want to make an announcement. Joe, would you like to do the announcement? We have sure, sure, absolutely. 
Can yes, I yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> what we're doing here, if you go to our Facebook page, uh, we just put an announcement up there uh, within the hour. Subscribers to our newsletter uh, will have the opportunity to win a Dick Biondi uh, t-shirt and mug. Uh, we will be uh, selecting winners at random starting uh, next week on our Zoom chat show, just like we're doing uh, right now. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way, fun way to uh, be a part of this very, very special film. You can, wow. uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's really, really fun. And so check it out. And how do you get to do that, Joe? How do you What's get to that? enter? How do you enter? Well, if you go to our uh, website, uh, dickbeyondyfilm.com, there's a section on there that says contact. And what you do is you fill out the information on there and you'll be subscribing to our newsletter and you'll be automatically entered into the contest and the random winner will be selected. Our first random winner will be selected starting uh, next week. How cool is that? Oh. And when we have oh. our next fundraiser, you can wear your shirt and bring your yeah. home, and we can celebrate together. I'll have, to lose, I'll have to lose some weight so my shirt doesn't look ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're all sitting around eating and oh. I know. <laughs> I have a one minute song for it if you want. Oh, you want yeah. Sure. Okay, let's do it. This is a song from one of my CDs. I wrote this dedicated to all my musician friends. Oh. And the music, musicians understand what this is about, okay? <laughs> It's called The Folk Singer's Dream. Last night I had the strangest dream I'd never had before. I dreamed I played my folk songs at the open mic next door. The audience had numbered five, I knew them every one. Quietly tuning their instruments, waiting till I was done. Then to our amazement, by the door did stand a young man who was neatly dressed with no guitar in hand. We welcomed him to our music fest. We all made such a fuss. It's seldom that we play for one who's not a folky like us. It's Yay. true, kind sir, he said to me, I am no troubadour. I just came in to get change for the meters, and then he was out the door. <laughs> Very good. Bravo. Bravo. You have a good voice, Dean. I, I really oh, like thank you. Voice. Thank you. <laughs> what key is that in? A minor. Okay. I thought I heard an A minor there. Okay. Yeah, an a minor. <laughs> All right. This has been fun. Thanks so yeah. much, you guys. And to everybody who's watching, we hope you're staying safe and you're yeah. still doing your social distancing. I know it's getting old, but we're still here and we got to be careful. Yeah. So, yeah. absolutely. As long as Thank we're all safe and we're still here together, we can continue and keep sharing all this love and all this great music. And we can't wait till the film comes out. Thank you. Me Thank neither. You so we're much. working on it as we speak. We're still working on cool. it. Yeah. DickBeyondFilm.com. Please like our yeah. Facebook page and join our Facebook group. And it's growing and growing work. and growing each day. A lot of fun, yeah. fun stuff on there. So come join the Dick Beyondy Film team. Let's go, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you.